Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Chilton, Explorer Chair for Space War Fighting Studies at the Mitchell Institute's Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence. And welcome to the release of our latest policy paper entitled Maneuver Warfare in Space, the Strategic Mandate for Nuclear Propulsion by Chris Stone, who is a senior fellow at the Space Power Advantage Center for Excellence. We're also incredibly fortunate to have with us today Dr. Michael Leahy, who's the director of DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, and Dr. Ron Feibish, the senior director of strategic development at General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome you gentlemen to our program today. As a bit of an introduction, our Space Force requires the agility, maneuverability, and speed necessary to both deter and respond to the threats we face in space. As you all know from the headlines, China and Russia have been deploying anti-satellite weapons, which means the space power advantage the United States enjoyed for decades is now at risk. One of the key reasons why Congress created the US Space Force was to ensure that our nation had the personnel, the doctrine, and the weapon systems necessary to deter against aggression. Uh, any and attacks on our critical space infrastructure. And that requires a shift in how we design and operate our assets on orbit. Bottom line is we need to build new, a new generation of satellites that can maneuver rapidly both for transit, but also for defensive purposes and offensive purposes. And that's the point of our event today, to discuss Chris's paper, which addresses how we can realize this maneuver capability through nuclear propulsion. While this might sound a little bit like science fiction to some, it's something that the US government has been developing for decades. It's also a technology that the Chinese are planning to exploit in the near term to gain their own maneuver advantage in the space domain. If you read their official publications, they're talking about having quote, fleets, unquote, of nuclear powered spacecraft by 2040. So without further ado, let's jump into the paper in more detail, but with a summary by our author. And following Chris, uh, we'll invite Dr. Leahy to share his perspectives. He and his team managed the Draco program, the effort currently driving this technology at DARPA. And as our cleanup batter today, we'll have Dr. Ron Feibish, who is also working on the leading edge of this technology at General Thomas. As a quick note to our audience, feel free to raise your hand using the function on the application and submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the second half hour of the program. With that, I'd like to introduce Chris Stone, our author. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to be with you all and uh, to discuss this paper, which is very important because, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, sir, we are we are no longer in a in a situation where we're in a, a sanctuary in space, if that ever existed. We're in a warfighting domain, and even more so than being a warfighting domain, we're in a contested domain. And the the more time goes on, the more the Chinese and Russians pursue their deployments, the more that's going to be. And so, this paper is designed to provide policymakers with options to address that and other issues in the near term and uh, make sure that we can get ahead of our adversary because we have an opportunity based on our experience with the technology to get ahead of this problem and not be playing catch up like we have been with say hypersonics. So we're gonna go through this really uh, high level and then we'll discuss it more as we, as we get into the Q&A. So right now, the, the current situation that we're finding ourselves in is China and Russia are seeking decisive war fighting advantages in space. And what that means is, is that with their current technology that we're used to hearing about, such as anti-satellite interceptors, lasers, and such, they are uh, operating in what they call mobile warfare, or as we call maneuver warfare. And in the future, near-term future, they are looking at uh, including vehicles with nuclear propulsion that is capable of rapidly transiting between all major orbits around the Earth and out to cis lunar space and back. And if they get that as they're planning on doing it, and they have shown that they have the ability to do so in a, in a fairly uh, consistent manner of development, they will give them uh, deterrence and war fighting advantages over our current situation. Let me give you an example, an analogy rather. Our current satellites, while maneuverable to some extent, 
are very limited in their ability to maneuver. They're kind of like the airships of 100 years ago. And what the Chinese are looking at pursuing with nuclear propulsion is similar to having a, a high-flying, rapid-moving fighter plane. And obviously, if you know anything about World War I and after, airships versus a fighter plane really don't stand a chance. So we have to consider this option and get ahead of, of where they are. So we have advantages in space, as we're all well aware. Um, we're very reliant upon it for all these things, such as GPS constellation, which is part of our critical infrastructure. It's a tied into our economy. It's tied into transportation energy, as well as our military uh, ability to, to operate our uh, terrestrial forces. But it has limitations. And it, one of those is because of the predictable and tractable orbits that they're in, they're vulnerable to non-kinetic and kinetic attacks in from and to space. And also because of that predictable and trackable orbits and because of the design of the satellite system themselves, they have very limited maneuver capability because they have by design a limited propellant. It's meant to keep them in their mission orbits, station keeping as it's called, maybe some minor adjustments for, for conjunction or debris avoidance. But other than that, it really is not designed for rapid maneuver. And so our current Space Force Constellation model uh, as they are currently today are not ready for an enhanced maneuver warfare threat from China. Now, briefly about what space maneuver warfare is, many people have this viewpoint of what maneuver warfare is, such as uh, tanks maneuvering around forces on the ground. And that has a piece to that, which we'll discuss more later. But the objective of maneuver warfare is to establish and sustain your strengths and advantages over your adversary while exploiting enemy weaknesses. The key to that is the center of gravity of critical vulnerability. And the Chinese view our space assets because of those vulnerabilities we mentioned in the previous slide, um, that is something that must be hit hard, fast, and continuously, and to proactively do so as a means of deterrence and war fighting advantage. And they believe the key to doing this is through nuclear thermal propulsion. As, as, as the general mentioned, um, per open sources, they're, they're articulating the need to have fleets of these things by 2040. But because they have a very long view and they're very methodical and step-by-step -step in getting their systems moving, um, it's very likely that we'll see something as early as the 2030s. So it's very important that we understand this, this threat, both the current threats of how they're maneuvering around our conventional force advantages with their anti-satellite missiles and lasers, but also their future near-term um, quest to get nuclear thermal propulsion, like you see in the bottom right, for cislunar activity and Earth orbital activity. Now, the good news is uh, this is not a new technology to us. This is not something that we're not familiar with in the United States. We've been studying the feasibility of using nuclear thermal propulsion since the late 40s. We've tested them up to, up to technology readiness level six or so in the 1960s with NERVA, which is the engine you see in the pictures and the cutaway. And they also tried to, to make a comeback in the 80s and early 90s with the Strategic Defense Initiative, but they were all canceled and never flown in space due to uh, policy and budgetary restraints that were made uh, for various reasons in various administrations. But the DARPA Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations or DRACO program that DARPA TTO is working seeks to fix that by actually demonstrating this technology in space around FY25 or so. So what are some of the benefits of, of this? Well, there are four that I will get into for, for shortness of time. One is that it's reliable, it's more fuel efficient, it has greater energy density capability, and because of advancements in materials and other technology, it's safe. So let me give you a little bit of uh, background on some of those. So in chemical propulsion, it's essentially a controlled explosion. It has a combustion chamber. Everything has to work just right for it to have the performance it's designed for. With uh, nuclear propulsion, you don't have that. It's a more simple design. It heats up hydrogen in the reactor and excites those particles and generates thrust. It's more fuel efficient. So with less propellant, you can operate for longer mission times and go out to the moon and back with, with one essentially tank of gas or so. And by energy, it takes a lot of energy to maneuver around the earth and out to the moon and back um, to do various missions. And so you need a lot of energy and nuclear propulsion can provide more than 100,000 newtons of thrust, which is essentially enough to accelerate a car from zero to 60 in less than a quarter of a second. So with the energy density of over 4 million times greater than that of hydrazine, which is a common propellant used on our satellites constellations today, you have that ability to move faster that General Chilton was mentioning earlier. And then also, which is a key um, matter for many people, as we all know, is safety. And thanks to the design advances over time, 
Uh, these are essentially the reactors or heating units stimulate the propellant, like I mentioned, by a nuclear energy. And when they're launched or stored, they're launched on a chemical rocket. They're not launched on nuclear propellant and they're in a cold state, which means that they're not radioactive of any magnitude until they get into a nuclear safe orbit. And until the reactor is turned on, it is designed for safety, uh, as we'll probably get into more discussion with our experts today. Now, General Chilton, uh, from personal experience, has told me that Delta V, or the ability to maneuver and change velocity as needed, is the coin of the realm. And so as a result of that understanding and through the research we've done, this report offers six recommendations to the Space Force on how to get ahead of this problem and to uh, be able to beat our adversaries to this kind of maneuver advantage. First, the U.S. Space Force should have a force design that in a mixed sense is capable of a decisive maneuver warfare advantage. And we believe from looking at all the alternatives that fielding nuclear thermal propulsion is the way to do that. We have 70 plus years of experience in development and experimentation and testing. And now is the time to make that decision to get it up in space, test it and operationalize it as soon as possible. To do that though requires resources and that means money. And one of the main reasons why a lot of these programs never made it is because they, their funding was cut off. So we believe that as it takes time to get funding going for a program of record, to get it out of the s &T world and across the valley of death into an operational program of record, we really need to begin that as early as FY24 to start that going in Congress to make sure that once DARPA Draco is proven that it can be operationalized as soon as possible for our needs. Now, in the meantime, um, while we're working on that and getting it tested, we need we still have that vulnerability of potential bleeding out of propellant due to different strategies and tactics of our adversaries with our current chemical systems. And we lack the, the ASAT technology of our own to hold their targets at risk. And so we need to deploy ground-based and space-based kinetic ASAT weapons to hold these targets at risk because this is how they believe in their doctrine and thinking is you have to hold space targets at risk um, in order to have true deterrence and more fighting advantages in space. And we can do that through SM3, standard missile threes, and ground-based mid-course interceptors, which have the technology and the program of record, just requires some modifications. And then as a bridge um, for added maneuver, not rapid maneuver, but added maneuver to keep them a little more safe and to you know, prevent that bleed out of propellant stores for uh, rapid maneuver or for maneuver for defenses, that is, um, mission extension vehicles, which are being tested up in GEO and other places by, um, by some satellite providers, I believe Intelsat, uh, they, these propellant packs go into orbit, they dock with the bus of the vehicle and provide the, its propellant as a means of maneuver rather than using the onboard stores. So that is a good hedge bridge capability that we could leverage in the near term until we can get um, a mixed force, including nuclear thermal on board. And then lastly, the Space Force really must improve its education and advocacy efforts about this and other types of threats, not just what kind of weapons they're, de they're developing, but the strategies and the reason why they're deploying those things. Giving the full picture is very key for the American public and the Congress to understand the need that we have for this. And nuclear propulsion can provide the agile maneuvering force capable of generating the range of offensive and defensive effects that we need in order to stay ahead of this threat. As I mentioned in the beginning, space is a warfighting domain. It's a contested domain. And this was not something that we wished upon ourselves. We did everything we could for decades to prevent that. Um, by example and others, this was created by the Chinese and Russians. They created this circumstance and we now must be ready. We need to be able to take the cue um, from our forebears and understand that being prepared is much better than playing catch up as we're now seeing with hypersonics. So with that, sir, that completes the overview and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I really appreciate the overview of the paper. And, and you know, something you talked about near the end, I thought was really important, and that we're doing this to deter attack. <clears throat> and you know, it's about showing that we can survive our uh, satellites that we need for national security by adding this element of survivability, which is maneuver capabilities that uh, we're limited to today with our current designs. So, you know, we always like to come back to at the Mitchell Institute, uh, uh, the, the discussion on why we're doing these things, what, what motivates us in, in that particular area. And it's, a, it's a, a, to deter our adversaries from thinking they can successfully attack these uh, constellations that are so important to us. So thanks for, for bringing that up in your paper, along with all the technical aspects and, and the other broad needs for these, these capabilities. Uh, now I'd like to uh, 
uh, I asked Dr. Fabish if he would uh, give us a, a, a I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Leahy first, and then we'll go to Dr. Fabish. Uh, Dr. Leahy, if you would give us some of your thoughts uh, with uh, and a review of what you're doing at DARPA to support this uh, effort. Thank you. Um, happy to. Thank you, sir. And thanks for the effort uh, on this uh, paper. We think, as you do, that this is something that's important to get into. A little bit of context here. You know, DARPA has a long history of doing, uh, making investments in space. And, and you can argue that space is part of our origin study or origin story, right, with Sputnik and the response to that, right? And not wanting to ever be surprised again in that same manner and be able to inflict surprise on our enemies when we have that opportunity as well. So over the years, we've done a number of different things in space across the board, specifically in propulsion, you know, F1 engines for the Saturn V, the Pegasus, the TARDIS, uh, Taurus, uh, Falcon 1, before there was a Falcon 9, was something that we started and, and got rolling uh, for that. And most recently, you know, we've made uh, some larger bets. We're in an ongoing with Blackjack, which is a Pelio constellation, which is another aspect of resilience in space, you know, that factors into this as well. And I noticed your comment on MEVs, Chris, and our program for RSGS, which is to put two uh, highly dexterous, very uh, capable robot arms uh, into space to be able to do on-orbit servicing is in partnership with uh, Space Logistics, who has the MEVs, and we'll put in MEPs. So now you can just take modules and plug them in as opposed to having the whole satellite because you can use the robot to do it. So as we looked around and started a few years ago to think what would be the next big bet we wanted to do in space, that turned us around to maneuver and mobility. I mean, it is a thing in TTO, a lot of the systems we do across all the domains get around to how do you deliver the effect to the place you want to deliver that effect to. But something that's new and unique or gives us a discriminating advantage. And as we looked toward that, we thought that nuclear thermal propulsion uh, was the place to go. And so we started up the uh, Draco program to kind of jumpstart uh, that activity and to leverage, as you said, work that's been going on for a long time in NASA and other places, but really focus that around a particular application. Right? One of the things DARPA really strives to do is to take you know, the work we stand on the shoulders of people who've done the subsystem and other work in front of us. We try to coalesce that when the time is right and put a focus on a project and getting something done quickly and rapidly and kind of you know, expanding and pulling everybody with us. And so that's what we're uh, looking to be able to do here. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go through uh, the Q&A and, and the presentation. Thanks, Dr. Leahy. Appreciate that introduction. And uh, now I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Fabish and uh, get his perspectives on some of the work they're doing at GA. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for having me uh, here. And uh, th this is really um, an important discussion today. Uh, at GA, we always start with a safety moment when we start our meetings. And one of my favorite safety moments is situational awareness. I think we need to be constantly aware of what's, what's around us for the sake of our safety and security and, and security and safety of others. And the same things happen in space. So this, this uh, uh, thrust we have, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, today to speak about space nuclear and the situ situational awareness and our deterrence abilities in space is really important and very timely. Um, we have one of those one in a, once in a lifetime opportunities uh, when the stars may very well be perfectly aligned to leapfrog the United States military's uh, situational awareness and defensive posture in space. Um, as was discussed uh, earlier by uh, both uh, Chris and Dr. Leahy, um, we are losing out fast um, in the technological ways to ensure that our national interest in space are protected and assured for many years to come. Uh, programs such as DARPA's DRACO are a great example of a technology solution that can help secure uh, such a U.S. leadership uh, position in space, um, especially when it comes uh, to our national security imperatives. GA is really proud to be uh, the sole performer for DARPA Draco in developing the reactor uh, system and engine for, for the Draco program that will enable this uh, technology in space. And we're working very closely with DARPA to make ensure that this is a success. Industry plays a key role in enabling those national security imperatives. 
In general atomics, uh, for example, this is done 24-7. This is uh, our, our bread and butter, and we're very, very proud of doing that. The well-being and national, of, and national security of our nation drives everything that a company like us and others do, from developing and deploying electromagnetic aircraft launch systems, the EMOLs, and advanced arresting gear for aircraft carriers in the United States, to advanced satellite and space communication systems, to nuclear power technologies for both the Earth, on Earth and in space, we always strive to continue and strengthen US national security posture in this ever-changing world and in the technological ways with a growing list of very able and capable adversaries, such as China and Russia. I'm really excited and grateful to have the opportunity to share some of the, these of my opinions today uh, with you and very much looking forward to a robust discussion today. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much for that inter those introductory remarks. Um, I know you brought it up, everyone, uh, and, and Dr. Leahy brought it up as well. Safety is the elephant in the room. And maybe the elephant in the room is perception uh, of the use of nuclear material in, in space. Uh, you know, NASA, of course, uh, has been using radioisotopic thermal generators, RTGs, thermoelectric generators, for since the Apollo program. So it's not new that you know putting uh, radioactive material in space to use it uh, for for benefit for human exploration. Um, but I think maybe if we could spend a little more time on, uh, we'll start with you, Doctor Fibish, on, on your experience and and you know give you this opportunity to educate us a little more on why you believe this is uh, the safety concerns can be adequately mitigated. And, and Dr. Fibish, I believe yeah. you're as, as I said, sorry, as I said, when it comes to safety, this is the, the first thing we all do ever think about. We, we start with safety with everything that we do and discuss. Um, in, in this case, um, people need to realize that when we launch this system into space, there's, there's no nuclear power driving anything in, in Earth, in the atmosphere when this is going up. This is a conventional chemical propulsion that takes the system into orbit. So the reactor is what, what's called cold state. Uh, there is no nuclear reaction whatsoever. There's no criticality in the system whatsoever. And we designed the system such that um, any event of, of re-entry while it's in the atmosphere will, uh, will be uh, completely mitigated by the design. So we design to safety. Safety is really what's driving everything that we do in terms of technological performance. Obviously, performance is very important, but we cannot uh, compromise on, sa on the safety of the system. Once it's in orbit, uh, obviously it operates and in such an orbit that you will never see re-entry into uh, the atmosphere of the of of, of Earth. So uh, it's it's foremost in, on our mind, and as uh, Chris described, it will it will never um, it, what, the, the possibilities of of uh, safety um, events um, that will compromise that are are uh, pretty much nil uh, in the way we design this. Thank you. I, I know that in the case of the RTGs, uh, which use plutonium. Uh, the uh, NASA worked really hard to make sure if there was an accident on launch, a high, you know, the rocket were to explode, that that uh, particular device would be so well shielded and strengthened that it would not disperse and uh, would fall harmlessly into the ocean launching out of Florida, or that it would, on a reentry case, it would not pose human uh, risk to humanity on, on the earth. Uh, if I could shift to you, uh, Dr. Leahy, I, I I'm told that the Draco reactor uses low enriched uranium versus highly enriched uranium. Uh, is, is there a, uh, a safety advantage to this or is this just the, the right type of material for the propulsion technology you wanna develop it or is it a bit of both? You might say it's probably a bit of both, but um, from our perspective, one of the key drivers uh, was, as I mentioned earlier, policies. Right, and the policies associated with being able to do demonstrations. Um, and quite frankly, before the National Security Policy Memo 20 came out, it was almost impossible to think we could get approval to do a demonstration. Uh, when that policy came out, it recognized that if I used high assay, low enriched uranium, then it moved the approval process down to the lead of the organization, which for us falls to DOD and SECDEF. 
So that was a, a bet and we could convince them that we were willing to take and something that we could control. Right? We don't like to get into projects where we don't have control of our destiny and what we're trying to execute and make happen. So that was a key aspect of this that changed the environment. That change gave us the uh, kind of freedom to relook at this and say, can we go do that? We understand we will probably give up a little performance in terms of that from a raw performance standpoint, but we believe we can achieve the kind of performance we need with this. And it inherently is a, uh, both from the policy side and otherwise a safer material uh, to be able to use. And as my colleagues mentioned, you know, one of the things when we put a program together, you know, we go off and we look at what is the overall system. So as Chris pointed out, we, we drove this by mission need, right? Maneuver, right? We wanted to be able to maneuver. And our focus of maneuver was in cislunar because it just obviously you can't, the huge <laughs> volume that you've got to be into doesn't give you really any good choices other than being able to do this. And we wanted to at least be able to be on maneuver on par or better than our adversaries in that space. So if we ended up being in the space equivalent of a dogfight or something, we could not be outmaneuvered uh, by somebody else when we were, were doing that. That focused us on kind of doing this program a little, Draco, a little differently than we might do some others. In that, as mentioned, we went and issued a contract to get uh, a reactor, a reactor developers the prime for the initial phase of the contract. Because if we can't make the reactor and we can't get it to do what we want, it doesn't make any difference, right? Um, we know how to do space vehicles and we were not looking to be the ones to decide what the ultimate system ought to be here. We just wanna create that risk, reduce the risk so the acquisition community and the Space Force can make that decision later on. So we have the track A performer, which is General Atomics, which is working on the reactor force and a couple track B performers, just doing some conceptual designs of how would I get that reactor into space to support the demonstration that we wanna be able to do. And, and one of the things that came up earlier is why we got into this now, it's kind of, we look for these inflection points and we got to the point where we felt that you know, my joking response in a lot of this is, I only take on programs that have one consecutive miracle. Uh, that's required to happen. And that was the reactor part. For those knowledgeable, there's a second miracle here that's doing cryohydrogen. I'm not taking that on in this particular program. NASA and other people working in that, we recognize that has to happen. But again, we don't have to do all the pieces ourselves. We have to take on some of those critical ones and help pull some other people along uh, with us to be able to do that. Thanks, Dr. Leahy. If I could put a ribbon around the safety issue, it sounds like from fundamental design of the system through uh, material selection, it's a top priority. And, uh, and, and, and I think that would hopefully give some peace to those who are concerned about these issues, which we all should be always about safety first in this particular area. And so thanks for both your comments on that. Uh, I'd like to shift gears here a little bit, go back to Chris. You know, Chris, you mentioned maneuver warfare and space is becoming a priority for the Chinese space forces. Could you give us a little more detail on what exactly you mean by maneuver warfare and how nuclear propulsion can be a game changer? Sure. So, so in, in maneuver warfare, uh, or as the Chinese refer to it as mobile warfare, they've they've used this for for hundreds, if not thousands, of years in both military as well as political arenas, even economic arenas. That for that matter. And like I said, the the objective is to exploit the vulnerabilities of your adversary to advantage. And maneuver warfare at the strategic level, there are two different levels of this. There's a strategic and a tactical. The strategic level deals with both the physical, the ability to have a capability, and psychological, the ability to get into the heads of the adversary and create friction or fear or whatever um, to deter them or prevent them from interfering or engaging in something that they find useful to themselves or a strategic objective, whatever that may be, and to keep their adversary from coming in and kind of getting in the way. So you have that psychological impact as well that, hey, we can have the ability to move somewhere more fast than any of your space vehicles. We can hold all of your targets at risk, um, not just from the ground, but in space. We can maneuver between orbits and out to cislunar space and do it multiple times without having to relaunch a new vehicle. And that kind of thing is a game changer from the psychological as well as the tactical level, which is the more traditional what people are thinking of is the ability to outmaneuver, as Dr. Leahy says, the space equivalent of a dogfight. So we want to be ahead of that um, before we can uh, to, to ensure that our security up there is, is taken care of. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chris. Um, I'd like to turn back to Dr. Fibish again. 
Um, you talked a lot about uh, the broad work that you're doing in, in this area. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe zero in on some of the, the challenges that you're realizing as you're going forward and, and how you're addressing those challenges and developing this technology. No, thank you for that question. Very important question. So let me just uh, mention, and, and, and Chris has mentioned that, that uh, we are not starting from scratch here. Um, 50, 60 years ago, there was a program called Lovell Nova, where a, a nuclear rocket has been developed. And actually, um, it was called a, a success. It, it reached a technology readiness level of six, which people are familiar with that. It's pretty much in the demonstration stage here on Earth. It was never launched in space. There were some uh, challenges, especially in materials and fuel. But we, you know, 50 to 60 years have passed. Since then, we have learned a lot about what can be done to make that uh, technology um, a complete success once it's being launched and to minimize any technological challenges that we have. And building on decades of materials and development and, and nuclear fuel development, uh, where we uh, actually at GA are producing some of the safest fuel um, on Earth, uh, the fuel that is used to our trigger research reactors, which are the safest, some would say the safest reactors on Earth, we are building on knowledge of how to do, how to make those materials uh, to enable um, safe and high performance uh, systems. So uh, we're not starting from scratch. We learned a lot over the past 50, 60 years and uh, we, we are ready to deliver it within the time frame uh, that, that is required for, for DARPA, the DOD, and our nation. Thank you for that. You know, um, there's, we've already talked about some other technologies that allow maneuvering in space. Um, uh, the MEV, you know, uses uh, chemical propulsion to extend the life of satellites on orbit. Um, some satellites uh, do carry uh, propulsion, fuel for propulsive reasons, whether it's to deorbit at end of life or to adjust their orbits as necessary. We were familiar with electric propulsion ion engines for often used for station keeping. But I think in one case, not too many years ago, uh, ion engine was used to actually raise the orbit of one of our AEH satellite, AEHF satellites to get it from its perigee all the way up to its appropriate geostationary orbit. So we've seen these other types of engines uh, be used. Um, are, do you see them uh, still in the future being complementary to uh, thermonuclear propulsion or being totally replaced by this capability? And what synergies might the group see? And I, I offer this to the entire group to uh, pitch in on um, between uh, those types of propulsive uh, sources and what you all are working on. I'll take a stab at that for you. I, I think that uh, this is a complementary kind of technology. I mean, like everything, there's no one shoot that fits all. Um, you're gonna want a range of things, not only in your propulsion technologies, and we're looking at other things, you know, as we always have continued to, how to make improvements in that. It's your architectures and you know, the investments we've made in, a, in a perforated LEO. In the same way, perforated LEO is not meant to be that we don't need MEO and GEO and things, other things. It's just it allows us to uh, take on different aspects of a mission that are more ideally suited uh, for that set of technologies and leave the big GEO birds for things they do best. Um, you know, doing on-orbit servicing and repair and, and being able to extend the life of satellites. So we've invested in all of those elements you know, going forward. And from our perspective, it's not to try to make a decision about how best to apply it. It's to be able to reduce the risk so that real decisions can be made promptly about how to use these capabilities to match up against the mission needs that the Space Force has so in the commercial environment as well. So that's what we're trying to do is put more options on the table so that the option set is overarching of what the needs are. You know, I, I would like to add to that. That's a very good, very good uh, input there. Uh, but, you know, nuclear thermal propulsion does offer um, unique performance that, that uh, other technologies may not offer in the immediate future. You know, the, the thrust being twice as much as a factor of two uh, greater than chemical propulsion, the, the workhorse, I would say, of, of, uh, of propulsion these days in space. Um, and and we think the technology readiness level of this uh, system that can meet the uh, timely deployment of them. So um, and, and in terms of um, 
the performance overall uh, and and this uh, uh, what's called the uh, thrust to to weight and and thrust to uh, propellant efficiency that you have um, it is in a unique position compared to other technologies so it is complementary because you will need electric propulsion you will need uh, uh, you know uh, other other forms of uh, uh, power enabled propulsion but uh, I think uh, it is in a class of its own uh, to address this uh, rapid maneuvering requirements and thrust requirements that are needed for the missions at hand. And by the way, well, I'll add one more thing, sir, if you don't mind. When you mentioned Please. the AEHF, um, the hull thrusters that were used to get it up to geo took weeks, if not months, to get it up to geo. I mean, that's 22,000 plus miles from, from its initial insertion orbit. So. The, the issue from a military perspective, especially when you're dealing with offense and defense, is the, the time factor that you can, with the energy, that thrust and everything that we've talked about, it allows that rapidity, that speed to address whatever threats you might need that you can't get from the slower but efficient propellant capabilities. Now, very good. Um, makes it, it makes your uh, satellite less predictable. Right, and, and that you can maneuver quickly and rapidly and maybe neutralize the offensive capabilities that an adversary is developing. I think that's, that's important. You know, thanks, Chris, for <laughs> quoting me earlier in your presentation about Delta V being the coin of the realm. If I could expand on that, you know, the, the ability to change your velocity in space, if you're, if you're doing rendezvous or proximity operations, which were, will be very important in the future for both defending and holding at risk, defending our constellations and holding at risk and adversaries. You know, if you're having to keep an eye on the gas gauge all the time, which I've had to do in, for personal, from personal experience during a rendezvous mission that uh, I participated in at NASA, you, you know, it, it adds a level of complication and uncertainty to success that this type of uh, technology could essentially remove uh, that risk. And you can focus on the maneuver, the transit, whatever it is you need to do to get there and not be keeping one eye on the gas gauge the whole time. Uh, and, and I think that is incredibly powerful. Uh, and so with that, hence the, that term Delta V is the coin of the realm. It's, it's incredibly important um, for the future uh, survivability of our constellations and, and for uh, maneuver in space. Uh, you know, gentlemen, they, um, there's always a cost to these types of programs and you we've all highlighted why there's been fits and starts along the way in, in this type of technology. Uh, part of the reason, part of the reason's been safety, part of the reason's been investment. But there's also an opportunity cost if you don't invest in this type of technology and you let others uh, take the lead or develop it while we don't. I wonder if you could maybe comment a little bit on what you see as the cost of inaction in this particular uh, area. And I'll offer that to all of you. Maybe Chris, we can start with you. You're, you're looking at it through an operational lens. So lens, please. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that question, sir. So from an operational perspective um, and from a readiness perspective for what is coming, uh, a maneuver warfare enhanced type of environment where we have to be ready for, um, I'll just kind of think of a quote from, from General George C. Marshall back back several decades ago before a hearing of Congress where he basically said, paraphrasing, um, that the United States is almost has a tradition of, of waiting to the last minute to prepare for the conflicts that come to them. And they end up having to spend the early stages of the war playing catch up from a technology and a deployment, you know, robust deploy capability kind of standpoint. And he didn't wanna to have to see that happen in the future based on lessons learned from the past. And so what I see from this is the cost of inaction is, is we have the opportunity now, if we choose to do so, to take that 70 years of experience and the experience that we're gaining with Draco, that once we demonstrate that, we have the opportunity to operationalize that for offense and defensive purposes ahead of the announced Chinese uh, operational deadline of the 2030s, early 2040s. So, and that's not far away from 2022 um, from a budget and technology standpoint. So from an operational standpoint, we need to have that ability um, to go beyond our trackable 
standard old school design of, of mission. And like we say, it's complementary. Not every constellation or not every system requires that kind of defensive ability. You know, resiliency, absorbing hits might be a better option for certain things. But but for some of our critical capabilities and our offensive and defensive war fighting forces, I think having the ability to have that agility, rapidity, um, and maneuverability is, is vital. Thank you. I would add to that that, you know, one of the things when we make an investment at DARPA, you know, we famously talk about the six Hellmeyer questions. And I'll tell you, one of those is why now? Right. And, and that's always a very big one, you know, with it, because if we understand how long it's been going on, the why now is two couple key things for us. One was the policy change. Two was the mission need. Right. We started to see that, as we talked about, Chris, in your paper before, when this was more of a sanctuary, there wasn't a driver that said, I need to have this kind of capability to be on par or stay ahead of my peer adversaries. So we didn't. It's a big investment. We're going to make it. And the third is we're able to now also partner with other people outside DOD. I mean, NASA has their mission to Mars. It's going to require nuclear thermal propulsion and nuclear power. So there's some overlap between the needs on the you know, non-DOD side and the DOD side. That's also a good confluence of then being able to work together as a nation to be able to advance this technology for multiple purposes, right? So that we can use Draco as a means to get both what we need and to understand from a DOD standpoint, but also to do a lot of risk reduction for what we want to be able to do in the uh, you know, commercial kind of space environments and space exploration. So I think those three things kind of drive a what's why now kind of piece for it. And as mentioned before, uh, being one that has been, you know, both uh, an agency that had the lead in hypersonics, watched it go away, right? Why we did no action. And now I'm in a tail chase. Um, I would prefer not to be there again. Thank you. Yeah. I think that that's a great point. And, you know, this um, um, synergies between the commercial and defense sectors, we, we, have, we cannot let this go. The momentum is here. We had this uh, ebb and flow in investment in this technology over the past 50 to 60 years. Um, we were, as Chris said, from a reactionary posture, we need to get into a proactive posture in this country, and this, which is happening now. And this is the why now question that... Uh, uh, Dr. Leahy has just described. And uh, the price of inaction is losing on this momentum and, and giving it up to our adversaries at this point. And we have the technology, we have the engineering solutions, we can get it up there, and we need to make sure that it happens. Uh, there's really an alignment here of multiple uh, interests and, uh, and benefits, and we need to capitalize on that and make it happen. Uh, I think if we stop, it will be tremendously de detrimental to our country and our national security. Well, thank you all. Well, listen, I could hog all the time asking questions and run us out of time, but I want to give uh, our listeners and those who, who have joined the, the dialogue and our audience a chance to ask their questions. So uh, we'll go and open up the session for Q&A right now to the audience. Feel free to direct your questions to uh, one or more of our panelists. And uh, our colleague, Lucas Ottenried, will uh, facilitate this. He'll call on you. And what he, when he does, just remember to unmute your mic and please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. You can also participate uh, through the chat function uh, and, uh, and Lucas can read those questions uh, to the panel uh, as they come in. So uh, Lucas, I see hands flying up all over the place. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, let's first go to uh, Pete Chin. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Okay, super. Hey, just a quick question for Dr. Leahy primarily, which would be, what are some of the commercial applications potentially of SNP beyond defense, if you have some perspective on that? Over. Uh, the short answer perspective, I would say, for there is more for uh, exploration, right? For being able to uh, make the trip to Mars uh, much more efficiently uh, than we could today, right? Um, and so I refer to you more for to NASA for more details on that, but it's a central kind of technology for what they want to be able to do, both in propulsion and then in power aspects, potentially for basing on the moon and, and other places as well. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll go to uh, Matt Sanchez. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Just making sure you can hear me. 
Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I truly enjoyed it. Um, because we're dealing with nuclear materials, I'd like to know who is sort of defining the risk criteria. Is it the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Can you just sort of speak to, you know, the fact that we're using these, um, I would say, non-traditional uh, propulsion uh, technologies, only in the sense that we've been using chemicals for such a long time? Um, when you look at space mission analysis, of course, risk, and I think you spoke to it a little bit in the seminar this morning. Um, could you maybe speak to that? Thank you. I would say that, you know, we're exploring, part of the reason we're doing the studies we're doing now is to explore that question. And we are working very closely in concert with DOE and others who have more cognizance over that and have years of experience in terms of being able to do it to make sure that we are going to address all the things that we have learned are important in a way that ensures safety, right? So as part as we do the design, as we do that part of, you know, any of these things at this point is also a journey of discovery where you, you find things and then you address them, you know, um, and figure out how best to uh, satisfy them. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think next we'll go to Andrew Cook. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we got you. I, I, okay, great. Um, General Chilton, Chris Stone, Dr. Leahy, Dr. Feibish, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Andrew Cook. I'm involved with one of the most successful creators of space nuclear propulsion systems. And I'm very interested from the perspective of yours, General Chilton, but also Dr. Leahy and Chris Stone, what do you think are the four most important criterion or priorities that a space nuclear propulsion system has to have? What are its critical characteristics? <clears throat> you mentioned safety, but I, I would be interested from a, a user's perspective, from this Defense Department's perspective, <clears throat> what might be, <clears throat> pardon me, the four critical performance parameters you really want to see? Thank you. Well, you directed it to me. I, you know, we have much better experts here than I, but you know, I would obviously uh, echo your uh, your remarks, Dr. Cook, with regard to safety. But also, you want something with longevity. I, again, I like to not have to be keeping my eye on the fuel gauge when I'm operating, and I think you want something that has the ability to vary uh, the power output so that you can maneuver not just at one speed, but you know when it's time to be efficient, to maneuver efficiently, when it's time to maneuver rapidly, you can uh, increase your velocity or your delta V and, and get someplace uh, quicker or get out of the way of a threat more quickly. So I didn't give you four, but those are three on my list. Just off the top of my head, I'll turn it over to the panel now. Yeah, I'll just mention, as, as we mentioned in the, in the paper, the it's more fuel efficient. It's more reliable from a standpoint of you don't have to worry about combustion or uh, explosion risks. You uh, have the ability to have the energy necessary to make rapid and, uh, and multiple maneuvers in, in across the orbits, which as we all know, that takes a ton of energy to do so. And uh, the more energy you can get, which the best is nuclear thermal, uh, the better, especially if you also have to go out to cislunar with as, as we're seeing, um, the, the Chinese are, are doing a lot more out there and so are the Russians and even commercial sector. So having that ability is great. And then fourth, as we mentioned before, safety, uh, you have all four of those, uh, you have the ability to leapfrog where we currently are with a limited maneuver capability to a highly maneuver capability. And that will give us, uh, I believe decisive advantages, uh, over our current structure. From our perspective, you know, I won't necessarily give you a four because I don't, we don't break it down that way, but I, there's certainly a, a level of performance uh, that we think is required to be applicable for these missions. So there's a threshold for that that we want to be able to get across. Um, there's a safety aspect for it. There's endurance and there's also cost. I mean, frankly, I mean, this will not be cheap to do, but it can't be an unlimited budget either. And so, you know, can we, you know, do this in a way that we can afford uh, to be able to do it and set up for a design that we can then further reduce the price of as we apply it. Okay, great. I think next we'll go to uh, Adam Gorell. Hey, 
Hey, good morning. I uh, typed mine in the chat as well, but I'll ask it here. Um, to uh, Dr. Leahy Dr. and Dr. Fabish, if I heard correctly, uh, low enriched uranium is the fuel for this propulsion concept. Um, these designs require additional reactor designs and materials beyond the historic NERVA designs that focus mm -hmm. on high enriched uranium. If, if LEU is going to reduce the TRL, uh, what more is needed from the academic community to continue to advance this low enriched design? So, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can take that question. So I, I, I think we are, um, I think we are actually beyond the academic exercise here. I think we, like we said, we have accumulated a lot of experience in uh, materials, advanced materials for high temperature operations and advanced nuclear fuels over the past five decades since the, the Rover Nova program. Uh, we, have a, we have a pretty good idea uh, of, of how to implement those advancements to get to the end point. So I think we are at a developmental slash demonstration slash deployment stage where we actually making this technology uh, and, and are going to deploy it in the next uh, you know, three to four years, that, that's the goal. So we better not be in the research phase <laughs> at this point. Uh, but obviously we work closely with the national labs and others uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, capitalize on everything that has been developed to date uh, with, between industry, um, the national labs complex and, and academia. So we're building on everything that has been done, but we're certainly out of the research phase. Okay, uh, next question comes from chat. This is from Patrick Tucker. He said, for Dr. Leahy, uh, do you have a sense of the cost of manufacture for a nuclear propulsion satellite versus a chemical propulsion satellite? Uh, sure we do. Um, doesn't mean I'm gonna share it with you today though, because um, I don't wanna prejudge what that answer is. We will we'll have proposals out for what we're doing going forward. Um, and you know, at, at this point, cost is not the principal uh, variable for us, it's understanding the kind of perform, what is the cost for the kind of performance that we want to be able to achieve? So it's those combination of things that we're after understanding uh, at this phase. We do uh, watch the cost because we don't want to go down a path that doesn't have a way to be able to get to something we can afford. But frankly, part of what we're doing in phase one, as we do incorporate that low enriched uranium knowledge into those designs that we had from before, is what is that cost going to be to do that demonstration? And then what do we believe that projects out to be in the future? But I don't have a solid answer for you now that I can share with you. Okay, the next one's from uh, Eric Jackson. He asks, uh, it seems to me uh, SNP advocacy needs to be a whole of government initiative vice a DOD centered effort if we were to succeed in the face of strong anti-nuclear positions. I would value your thoughts on how we could bring in uh, the Department of Energy and other parts of the interagency into the advocacy effort to help the Space Force. That's a great point. Um, I think it's part of what we're doing here is to try to build, you know, some advocacy and awareness uh, for it. We have been uh, working and collaborating very closely with NASA uh, for what they're doing in, in this area, all the way up to the administrator level. We have been working with DOE and others. Uh, but that point about trying to get folks comfortable with where we are and to accurately understand that is what forums like this, uh, these papers and others, you know, start a process to do. Uh, so that we can build that kind of advocacy up. I mean, this wouldn't have been, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if it wasn't aligned with the national space policy where that's going. And that's a joint all of government kind of activity as well. Uh, so while I want, there's still work to be done. I think we are, have the right things moving in the direction we need to for right now. And we'll continue to build on that. And I'll just add one more thing um, to Dr. Leahy's point is, as he mentioned, the policy changes were very important to make this happen. And most of that happened within the interagency. So people in the interagency at the National Space Council level are familiar with this because everybody had to be coordinated on that, on that policy change before it became a real deal. So I think as long as we can get everybody to keep moving in the same direction like we had uh, during that point in time a year or so ago, I think we have a good shot at making this happen. I would I would add just that uh, you know as as industry we're ready to brief anybody who would like to listen to the progress and uh, achievements that we have uh, and and uh, and the plans we have to guarantee success to assure success of this mission uh, with all these uh, four critical you know uh, the, the question that Andrew Cook asked about 
what are the four most important uh, issues here. We, we want to make those real. Uh, so we are standing ready, as we do in this type of fora, to, uh, to educate and brief and inform anybody who would like to understand the nature of this technology and how it can get to the end point. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Ryan Weed. He says, it looks like the Chinese are developing an NEP solution, uh, which could have three to four times more Delta V versus NTP solution. Chris, should the US be looking at NEP as well? Yes, um, in the paper, we, we focus primarily on nuclear thermal, uh, but at the same time, nuclear electric is, is very important. Also, and I can let Dr. Feibish talk a little bit more about how this works, but there, there are ways that you can not only get thrust out of NEP, but also you can get energy for the spacecraft itself from the reactor. So you get, you get two for the price of one, if you will, with that. Um, but for the standpoint of speed and, and agility, um, and efficiency, NTP uh, seems to be a really good option. So it's good to keep both of them open. And I think it'd be great to have both if we could, but whatever we can afford and, and make happen, I'm all for it. I see one more hand uh, from uh, Michael Beaven. Hi, Mike, Mike Bevan, thank you. Um, I, I just had a, a, a brief comment um, and, and thanks to the, the Mitchell Institute for putting this uh, together. But I had the honor of serving on the National Space Council in the last administration and um, had a hand in the NSPM 20 and the, the rewrite that, um, as well as SPD-6 for the National Strategy for Space Nuclear Power and Propulsion and, and also the executive order promoting small modular reactors for national defense and space exploration. And I guess the comment I wanted to make was that uh, you know, the interagency, I think, was, was brought up and, and, you know, coordinating this um, was a whole of government uh, activity. And the, the idea was that, uh, you know, we were going to try to get folks on the same page, I guess is the best way to put it, where we didn't have folks uh, doing, running off and doing sort of, you know, bespoke <laughs> uh, different types of programs where it wasn't, uh, you know, everyone rowing in the same direction. Obviously, there's there's different requirements and, and people have unique things that they need, but the idea was to, to move forward and, and really promote um, high SA, low enriched uranium uh, for all the benefits that you have. But, but I think it was even mentioned here, but um, for policy reasons, um, you know, and proliferation concerns, uh, high SA is, um, high SA, I'm sorry, HALU is, is something that the commercial sector uh, can actually participate in. Um, highly enriched uranium obviously is not. So if we want to move forward and, and include the, you know, the commercial sector, which I, I think is, is key um, to doing this, um, you know, we're, we need to have the policies in place that, that let the commercial sector uh, really do what, what, what it is that they do. And I think there's a lot of promise out there with some of the, the new companies um, that are doing some exciting things. They have advanced reactor designs and they're creating their own fuel and their own fuel forms like Tracel fuel. Uh, and it's, it's real, it's happening now. The, the DOE has, um, these companies have, you know, billions of dollars of uh, uh, contracts that they're, they're building test facilities. So uh, it, this, this isn't, um, I guess the, the best thing to say is this isn't theoretical. <laughs> Things are happening now and there's certainly a lot of interest you know, not only in, in the administration and uh, departments and agencies, but as well, you can see on the Hill uh, in Congress, um, you know, things that they're, they're trying to do as well. So thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to comment. Yeah, Thank I, you, Michael. I, I appreciate your insights, particularly with your past participation in the development of policy in this area. And you bring up, the, I think, at the point that it, this is just more, broader than a DOD uh, effort. And uh, Dr. Feibish, can you, does that resonate with the work you're doing there at GA? No, absolutely. And, you know, we have, to, I think there was, it was alluded to that there's, a, there's years of experience also of terrestrial nuclear technology development that we are you know, leveraging here. It's not just space nuclear. We, we cannot put space nuclear as, as, you know, that's the only thing that's going on. I mean, nuclear uh, technology development has been going on since, uh, since the 40s and 50s in terms of commercial applications, as was noted. So 
those advanced materials and, and advanced fuels that we have developed over the past five, five decades have really matured. It got to a point where low enriched uranium type reactors can actually work under uh, all sorts of conditions that are needed for a specific mission. So we are there and we can really make that, uh, reduce that into practice today. I mean, it's being done. So uh, I really appreciate those comments and, uh, in, and I think it's, it's GA and others who are working very hard to make sure that those technologies will be available for deployment when they are needed. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time here, uh, and I want to thank the audience for their per participation, but particularly our panel here today. And Chris, thank you for your work on authoring this paper, Maneuver Warfare in Space, the Mandate for Nuclear Propulsion. I'd encourage everyone on the net here to read it. Uh, it it's part of what we do at Mitchell Institute for Space here. We, we want to inform and also start discussion on important uh, dialogues that we need to be having about the future of national security space. And there's clearly broader applications for this technology beyond, beyond national security. Uh, and I wanna thank again, uh, Dr. Feibisch and Dr. Leahy, and also uh, give you our very best wishes for the success of your efforts as you go forward. It's important for our nation and uh, important for the future. So thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us and a special thanks to our panel. <laughs>